All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I see we still have a few people entering the room, which is fantastic. Um, so we'll just go ahead and give it another moment. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the music. Such a fun song and a fun way to start today. Oh, Sarah Powell, never heard the song, but it put you in a great mood. That's wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that. It's Dua Lipa, which is a fun, it's called Levitating Dua Lipa featuring the baby. Kind of a fun song. All right, so it looks like we've got quite a few people here. So we'll continue to let folks onto this event, um, but we'll get started. So hi everyone and welcome to today's event, Growing Your Own Food Using Kitchen Scraps, featuring the one and only Emma Terrell, uh, who is also known as the Urban Botanist. My name is Livia and I work on the events team here at Algonquin and I will be your host today. So I'm so excited that you've joined us for today's event. Um, AC is truly always connected. You can tune into our live virtual events just like this one to stay connected to your AC community. The best part of events like this is that you already have something in common with everyone um, who's attending today. Uh, you're all interested in propagating and alternative food sources. So don't be shy. If you're comfortable and you're in the mood, feel free to turn on your cameras, engage in the chat and connect with your community. If you're feeling more introverted today, that's okay too. There's absolutely no pressure. Before we get started, I'm gonna go over a few housekeeping items. Um, so today's event does have closed captioning available in English. So if you'd like to turn it on, you can press the CC icon along the bottom of your toolbar. Following today's presentation, we will welcome you to participate in a Q&A session by raising your virtual hand to ask your question out loud, or you can type your question into the chat. Once the question and answer period begins, I'll start reading out those questions that have been placed in the chat, um, or I'll call on you if you do have your virtual hand raised. Today's event is being recorded, um, and the recording will be available to watch on the AC On Demand website in the coming days. A link uh, to that will also be shared in the chat now. So to kick off today's event, we're gonna ask everyone a fun question to answer. Um, so all you have to do, I'll ask you the question and you can type it into the chat and press send when you're ready. Um, so please ensure that you're sending it to both the panelists and the attendees so everyone can see your answer. So the question is, who is your favorite superhero? It can be a real person or a fictional character. So I'll give everyone a moment to type their answer into the chat. And on the count of, we'll count down from three, I'll have you send. So I'm gonna go ahead and type mine in. If everyone's got theirs typed in, again, real, real person or fictional character. So three, two, one, go. Oh, grade seven teacher, Jessica Jones, my mother, my husband, Iron Man, I put Spider-Man, my father, The Rock. These are so wonderful. Thank you all for sharing. Deadpool, yeah, <laughs> that's a great one as well. Perfect, so you all have a few things in common now as well. Um, so without further ado, uh, I would like to now welcome the creator and owner of the urban botanist, Emma Terrell. Emma is a naturalist at heart and is always looking for ways to engage with nature and share her love and passion uh, with others. This is what sparked the creation of the urban botanist. Nowadays in 2020, we often connection with nature, starve for that interaction with our environment that often goes too long between screen time. Emma's hope is to bring the outdoors inside and encourage urban dwellers to engage with the incredible natural world around us in an urban environment. She facilitates educational workshops just like this one, is an artist in biophilic design and is always looking to talk plants or bugs with anyone and everyone. So Emma, um, take it away. You are so excited for the session. Thank you so much, Olivia. Thank you for such a lovely introduction. Welcome everybody. Oh my gosh, happy Tuesday. I hope that you're all having a fabulous start to your day. And what a wonderful way to kind of break up the day a little bit. Maybe you're in between classes, maybe you're in between assignments, maybe you're just in between work or shifts or just kind of wanting to pop in to learn something new. And that's what you can expect during this workshop with me today. Um, as Olivia mentioned, my name is Emma. I am the urban botanist. I'm in Ottawa, born and raised a uh, female entrepreneur. And my goal is to connect with more people and encourage them to get excited about growing their green thumbs and engaging with nature. Um, I myself was feeling really starved for that connection a few years ago, uh, fresh out of university. I went to Carleton here in Ottawa and it was sort of what sparked my idea for starting the Urban Botanist. And I started it with um, terrarium making. So creating and designing 
sort of a tabletop ecosystem um, that you can sort of grow and watch flourish inside of a glass vessel. So that's sort of where the urban botanist started and it's really just developed and evolved into what it is today. And so I like to talk about all things gardening, all things nature, bugs, uh, everything, literally. Um, so if you are fired up about nature, just like me, feel free to follow me on all the social platforms. I'm on Instagram, I'm on TikTok, YouTube, all of the things. Um, and especially after today, because a lot of what we're going to be doing today is actually starting kitchen scraps. So if you at home are wanting to start some of the same kitchen scraps, follow along in uh, the journey to see how these scraps start to evolve as well and how we'll actually continue on with the harvesting and planting process. So feel free to check me out there. I'm at The Urban Botanist. I'm also on Facebook, like I said, all the platforms, all of the things. Um, so that's how you guys can find me. Um, but I'm really excited to talk about kitchen scraps because for me, uh, regenerative agriculture is such a topic that I'm incredibly passionate about. and truly growing even just one head of lettuce um, or you know your own herbs or your own celery or really anything yourself. There is so much power in growing your own food, not just in a sustainability standpoint from the ability for you yourself to grow and feed, grow and uh, feed yourself from your own food source, but also from a waste standpoint. You know, if you think about how many times you go out to the grocery store and buy one of those big plastic containers full of spinach or mixed lettuce, that is such a huge waste of a single use plastic that if you start growing your own lettuce outside, think about how many of those containers you can then uh, opt out from purchasing and recycling or, or you know, having go to waste by just simply growing your own. Same with tomatoes, really just any vegetable roots. Um, it's a lot harder to grow fruits here, of course, but if you can grow any type of food for yourself at home, not only is it such a rewarding experience, but it really does the planet some good. So we're going to talk about how to regrow some of these kitchen scraps. And it doesn't really matter what size of space you are growing from, whether you've got a tiny little balcony, no balcony at all, a big backyard, doesn't matter. Um, we've got something for you here today during this session. So get excited. Maybe type in the chat. Let me know if you have some kitchen scraps that you're thinking about growing yourself. Um, maybe you have some kitchen scraps that you've already grown successfully or unsuccessfully in the past. Let me know in the chat. I'm going to read through some of these little comments here. If you have grown something, um, we've got Alin who has lettuce growing from scraps. Amazing. Love to see it. Um, Emily, I've never ended. I, I want never ending chives and green onions. Hell yeah, Emily. Those are just the best. Some of the easiest to grow as well. Um, Stefan has chives, green onions, peppers, mint, sage growing from scraps. Holy moly. Amazing. I love it. Growing celery and green onions. Alin as well. Fabulous. So we've got some people here in the group who have grown already and that is super. Even if you've never grown anything at all, that is fine too. We're going to talk about some of the things, some of the common things that I think are easy for beginners to get started with. So I've got about seven different varieties here today. And even there, you know, we'll be talking about onions, but onions can be, you know, Spanish onions, red onions, green onions, um, potatoes. I've got sweet potatoes. I've got a Yukon gold potato, but really any potatoes. So really I'll be talking about seven sort of categories, um, but you can really break down those categories into a multitude of varieties or species. So we'll kind of talk about the basics, some of the easy ones, the easy ways um, to get started. And really all you need is a knife, a cutting board, um, water, a glass vessel is always really helpful. Um, but other methods can also include just a wet paper towel. So if you've got some Tupperware, you can use moist paper towel to um, start the roots of some of these, some of these vegetables as well. Um, another thing that I'll talk about is a lot of people make the mistake of just starting their cuttings in water. I've got some green onions here that I've started. We've got some healthy roots and uh, some new growth starting on the top here as well. But what a lot of people make the mistake in doing is 
they'll just keep their cuttings or their, their kitchen scraps in water indefinitely and just have their kitchen scraps growing in water. Now, this isn't the end of the world. Yes, you will grow your scraps. You can grow full vegetables from just a hydroponic standpoint. But if you're not adding fertilizer to that water, um, it's really missing out on excess nutrients that it would get if you were to plant it in soil. So I'm a huge believer in starting my scraps in water, getting those roots started, getting them nice and healthy, and then transporting them over into actual soil. The vegetables and herbs and roots that you start to grow from just water are going to not be as um, nutrient full. They're gonna be missing out and lacking some of those really essential nutrients that our plants get from the micro and macronutrients that exist in our soil. So that's something to think about when you start when you're starting off some of your scraps, you know, get them nice and, um, and, and full from the root standpoint, and then transfer them over into a soil growing medium. Okay. This is going to really pump up the nutritional value of your vegetables, of your roots. So if you're sticking to just water, that's okay too. If you've got a little bit less room, maybe you don't want to deal with the mess of it. All I would recommend is adding an organic, I always use organic fertilizer to the water of whatever vegetable or root that you're growing. And why I only use organic fertilizer, it's maybe seem kind, may seem kind of obvious, is anything really that I'm consuming, whether it's chamomile, cannabis, vegetables, roots, whatever it is, I'm always sticking to organic fertilizers, because anything that you're putting into your body, you got to think that that is actually going to be holding whatever fertilizer you provided it with. And I have some recommendations for fertilizers, um, but I'll save that towards the end if anyone is interested in hearing about what those might be. But organic fertilizer, you can't go wrong. Usually um, organic fertilizers are, are great for beginners as well, because you can't burn the plant. And this happens sometimes. Has anybody here burned their plant by over fertilizing? Maybe you just picked up the concentrate and you're like, great, let's just pour it on the plant. That's probably what you have to do, right? But in fact, fertilizers, especially liquid, um, you really do have to read the instructions on the back because it's very specific for how much you're supposed to be diluting that fertilizer into water. Um, and you can really easily kill your plant by, uh, by adding too much fertilizer. Um, a great way to actually DIY and make your own fertilizer at home is from banana peels. For anyone who already follows me on Instagram um, or TikTok, I do your own DIY easy um, banana peel fertilizer. And it's really, I eat a lot of bananas. I'm a smoothie gal. Um, so whenever I'm smoothieing, I'll save my banana peels. I put them in simply, um, you know, a glass jar like this. I put the lid on it, fill it with water, and I leave it for 48 hours. And what happens is all of the nutrients, specifically potassium, is leached out of those banana peels and then put into the water. So it's a great way to have a second purpose for those banana peels instead of just composting them straight away. Hopefully you guys are composting. I love, love, love composting. That's a whole other topic of discussion, but it's a great way to kind of give your banana peels a second life is soaking them in water for 48, 24 to 48 hours. It gives it enough time for those nutrients to, to leach out of the banana peels into your water. And then I will water my outdoor plants with it. I try to avoid watering my indoor plants with banana fertilizer just because it can attract and keep fruit flies um, around. So try to use that for your outdoor plants, but it's very rich in potassium, which is essential for healthy plant growth. Um, so this is a great way to introduce excess potassium to your plants. And last year I was growing um, tomatoes and it was my first year using banana fertilizer water. And my tomato plant, I don't know if this was the cause, I'm going to say probably because I've never had a tomato plant grow so big. Like it was literally out of control for anyone who maybe saw that last year when I was, you know, posting it on social media, it literally took over my garden, like completely took it over. So this year I'm actually using it a little bit more, um, you know, consciously being like, Oh, the last time it got crazy. Uh, but this year I'm actually taking a whole new approach for growing, growing tomatoes. And in fact, if anyone wants to learn more about growing tomatoes, I'm hosting another free virtual workshop tomorrow night. 
at 7 p.m. for the Italian Week Ottawa. So you can check that out, Italian Week Ottawa, if you want to learn how to prune, steak, grow the juiciest tomatoes that you can this year, um, you can check that out, all right? Uh, but let's get into kitchen scraps. I'll stop chattering along about that stuff, but that's there for you if you want. Um, let's talk about some of the things that I really like to grow. And um, maybe I'll start out with celery because I think that this is a really, probably everyone at one point has tried growing celery this way. How many people in kindergarten did the whole um, like food coloring in the water and watch the celery take it up? And we learned about vascular systems inside of plants. And it's still fun to do even as an adult. I mean, we've got to engage with our inner child. And I find a lot of gardening really is engaging with my inner child. It just gets me so excited to watch uh, leaves forming and bugs doing their thing in the garden. It's just, it's so awesome. And it's a great way to de-stress, which we all need these days. But celery is a fabulous place to start. Now for celery, really easy, really, really easy. Um, for So if you pick up celery, you know, this is one of the best ways to get started is what I do straight away when I pick up my celery is I cut off the bottom. That's what I do straight, straight away. I don't put the whole thing in my fridge. I cut the bottom three to four inches completely off of the stalk. Okay. So I remove that. And then what I do is I have a shallow dish. You know, you can use a dish with a lip. You can use a Tupperware container. You can use a cup, a glass um, vessel. And I'll just put, you know, a half an inch of water in there. Okay. And then what I'm simply doing is sticking the base easy into that water. And what will start to happen is you'll start to see stalks growing out the center. Okay. And I typically like to buy organic that way I continue to grow organic. So if you're thinking about starting your own little indoor kitchen scrap garden, try growing organic. It's truly really going to be the best for your health. So this is organic celery. And uh, simply that's, that's, this is literally all I did. What you're going to start seeing is not only a stalk growing out the center, but you'll actually see some roots forming at the base of this vegetable. Okay. Some other things that you might notice is the very exterior um, stalks here will maybe start to get a little bit mushy and that's okay, that happens. You can simply remove those pieces. It's not going to affect the propagation of this vegetable, but keep an eye on it. And every, every few days, and this goes for absolutely all of your kitchen scrap vegetables, I replace the water. You wanna have fresh water. You don't want bacteria building up. Um, you don't want any sort of yuckiness kind of forming in that water. It's a great way to sort of ensure the success of your kitchen scraps. All right. So this one's an easy one. Um, what I will do as soon as I really have a very pronounced stock with some leaves, leaves are the um, solar panels. They're the, they're the hard workers of our plants. So if leaves are not present, really your, your plant isn't ready to start growing fully and maturely because leaves are responsible for um, accessing our sunlight and photosynthesizing and ultimately providing um, energy to our plants. So really, as soon as you start to see some of these leafy bits, like you can see on the stalks here, that's when it's a good idea to start thinking about actually planting your celery stalk into some soil. So really all you'll have to do is stick that base into soil, cover the part that you've already cut and watch your celery plant grow. And so you'll be able to yield more and more and more um, with each harvest. So super easy. And then to kind of keep the delicious stalks nice and fresh, I always have a glass of water in my fridge that I put my stalks in right after cutting. So that's a great way to ensure that you're, you're, you're not wasting, you know, your vegetables are gonna stay nice and fresh for longer. So that's celery. Easy, right? How many people here have tried this before? Few people. Few people. Amazing. And we had a question come in about sunlight and that's a really great question. So for celery, for most of your green vegetables or your leafy greens, they do like to have bright indirect sunlight. You don't want to be putting them into any sort of direct, direct light, um, but bright Indirect light is absolutely perfect for your celery and for any of your leafy greens. Now, for something like potatoes, which we can talk about next, I've got a regular potato and a sweet potato here. Potatoes really prefer a cool and dark place to grow. How many people here have had their potatoes, you know, you open up your cupboard and you're seeing like, like this crazy freak show of something like growing and starting its whole new habitat inside of your, your pantry? 
a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. We've got some thumbs up here. It's, it's, it's their preferred place of growing. So that's actually why it's ideal for you to plant your potatoes in the springtime when the temperatures are still a little bit cooler. And you always want to plant your potatoes four to six inches deep inside of whatever garden bed you may be growing in. But um, growing potatoes is also very easy. Um, this one specifically didn't really have any eyes started, but you'll know what I mean when you see those little um, nodes kind of forming on your potatoes. And what you what you would want to do if you really wanted to start growing a potato is you can either um, take some, some toothpicks, stick them all around the outside of your potato and have it stick inside of a glass vessel like this where it has access to water and it will really just start to shoot out some vegetative growth. And at that point, you can plant it inside of, um, you know, any sort of pot. Um, you can plant it inside of a raised garden bed if you really want to try growing potatoes, which is kind of just a fun experiment. I'm not an expert by any means. Um, we're all urban botanists in our own ways. And so, you know what? Give it a try. Uh, potato is like 30 cents. So why not give it, you know, a shot? It's just a fun little experiment that you can do at home. One thing that I'll say is if you do have a potato with lots of different grow points that have already started, you can cut your potato in sections, either two or uh, one or two times you can cut your potato. And if you are cutting it up, so let's say you've got multiple eyes or multiple nodes or growth points, you want to try and get at least two grow points per section. So if I were to cut this potato right in half, I'd like to have at least two eyes or grow points on either side. And when you're cutting your potato, you wanna make sure that you're letting these cut points dry out for a day or two. So you're not sticking this directly into soil straight away. You also always wanna make sure that any eyes or any um, nodes that have a little bit of vegetative growth coming out are always being planted so that that growth can continue to grow vertically or grow upwards, okay? But for starters, you wanna make sure that you let these points dry out. And the reason for that, similar to if you were propagating a succulent, you wanna make sure that um, you're letting that sort of uh, wound site callus over. And the reason for this is so that um, you can avoid rot. If you stick this right into soil straight away, um, bacteria or any sort of fungus that may get access to the vegetable itself um, can actually cause it to rot. So you want to leave it out for a couple days, let that wound site sort of um, heal over, and then you can go ahead and stick that right into soil and it will grow and do its thing, which is totally awesome. Love potatoes. Um, kind of just a fun thing to, to try, you know. Um, that goes the same with sweet potatoes, okay? Pretty much any potato you're going to be growing the same way, all right? Um, okay, let's talk about ginger, one of my favorite, favorite spices to use um, in the kitchen. I absolutely love, I'm, I'm vegetarian, so I eat a lot of curries. I make a lot of my own curry pastes. So I'm using ginger a lot. And um, a great way to start out ginger is you can see that I have it soaking here. And what I do with, you know, store-bought ginger is I let it soak for a few days. And the reason for that is because a lot of ginger actually has a spray that's been put on it. That's an anti-grow spray because this root actually grows incredibly easily, really, really fast and um, with ease, efficiently and effectively. So why I soak it is to kind of get some of that anti-growth spray that can exist on some store-bought ginger so that it's not sprouting and growing in the grocery aisles. This is a great way to kind of remove that and make sure that um, you're kind of getting a lot of that spray off. But um, when you're shopping for ginger, I always like to search for ginger that has a lot of, again, nodes or these little sort of bumps. These are going to be grow points. Now there's multiple ways that you can propagate ginger. Um, and I'm gonna show you some of those ways right now. One way for starters, easy, if you kind of just want to see what happens and you don't really want to do all that much, is you can take a container just like this, okay? I just moisten the paper towel. You want to have a little piece of paper towel in there. Make sure it's just moist. You don't want to have too, too much water in there, okay? You don't want it filling up. You just want the paper towel to be moist, okay? So that's about that there. 
And literally you can just leave it. You can just leave it and watch it grow. That's one way of doing it. Truly watch it grow. You'll see little green points start to shoot up. And then this, this type of plants just sends up really tall stalks. And it's usually going to be sending out those stalks from those nodes, okay? And from there, you'll really just start to see a whole um, system of roots growing just underneath. And this is just a very easy way to kind of just try something. If you're like, oh, I just wanna try anything, try ginger, seriously. Moist paper towel, shallow Tupperware container, chuck it in there. Again, it does like to have darker, um, a darker place to grow as well. But as soon as you start to see some of those, anytime you start seeing green is when you need sunlight because chlorophyll needs sunlight. So up until you start seeing that green vegetative, vegetative growth, you can leave it in sort of a cool dark space and watch it start to shoot out new growth. Another way that you can propagate ginger if you want to maybe keep some of this for cooking is you can actually just cut some of those nodes. So what I do is I cut on a triangular sort of way. I'll cut out sort of a triangular tip. And the reason why I'm doing it like that is because now there are multiple growth point opportunities for this node to potentially take root. And what I'll then do with that is I'll just stick it in my moist paper towel, easy breezy just like that. And I'll give you guys a hack, something that is not all that well known. I'm gonna open this little piece of paper towel up a little bit so I can show you. So I'll put that little guy there. I'll cut up another piece or two. That's fine, just like that. Again, probably good idea to follow along on social media to see how some of these actually start to look in a couple of days. And so you can also show me what yours looks like in a couple of days. But I'll just place them just like that. Oh, smells amazing. I love, love, love ginger. Oh my gosh. There's actually a, a big um, debate as to whether or not ginger is considered a rhizome or a root. Has anyone ever had this discussion or thought about it? Basically a rhizome is, is anything where you can take a section of that, of that, um, that plant and take a tiny little piece of it and it will grow a whole new organism or a whole new plant versus a root, which would be, you know, a carrot, for example. Um, there's a little bit of discussion as to what this is considered, but um, I, I think that it really does fall into the fact that it, it is a rhizome and that you can just take a small little section, a small little portion of it and grow a whole new organism. So before I jump out of ginger, I'm going to kind of segue into onion because I'm going to share with you this fun little fact that not a lot of people know about. If you notice in the grocery aisle, you will never see onion and garlic paired together in the grocery aisle. You won't see onion paired with a lot of root vegetables in the grocery aisle. And the reason why is because onion actually promotes growth or can stimulate the growth of your ginger, of your carrots, of a lot of um, root plants. So grocery stores really like to avoid putting onion too close to any of those vegetables because it can actually um, trigger some growth. So what I like to do is I'll, I'll show you how to um, regrow onion what you wanna do is you wanna cut um, the blossom, I call it. This is sort of the blossom and these are, these are essentially dried roots. But what I do is I'll cut from here and what I'll do is I'll just take a cut. This will save and I'll show you what I'm gonna do with that next. I'll take a shallow dish. Where's a shallow dish? I'll use this one. Fill it with a little bit of water. I'll remove the skin, okay? Just because that can potentially rot the plant. So I'll remove some of that papery skin. And then I'll simply stick that in a shallow dish. And this will kind of have a similar growth to our celery in that you'll start to see that centerpiece really start to shoot out a stalk and start to grow. And then you can quite literally plant this again in soil and grow your own onions, which is so awesome and amazing. So that's how you would you reuse onions to regrow kitchen scraps, okay? But back to this piece over here, what I'll do with this is I will cover my ginger, 
Okay, those little nubs of ginger that we already cut out. I'm just gonna cover that with the moist paper towel. And then I'm gonna take a little bit of onion. I'm gonna just remove that papery exterior. And I'll just cut it into small pieces. And I'm gonna sprinkle that onion just on top of my ginger. And this is going to promote root growth for those fresh little propagated pieces. I'm gonna put that away so I don't start to cry on camera. But this is kind of a fun way to, it looks like we're mixing together a recipe and honestly, this looks delicious already. This looks like the first starts of some of my curry pastes that I'll make, but this is a really cool um, and fun experiment for you to try at home for growing your own ginger and kind of promoting that growth. Maybe it would be fun to have um, two samples. Start, try your own experiment at home where you've got ginger without onion on one side and ginger with onion in another container and see what the difference is. I, I promise you, you'll see a lot more growth with the onion. So follow along to see how this turns out. Same thing with red onion. Okay, you can use red onion. You can really use any onion. I like to stick to a yellow or Spanish onion. But, but same thing for if you wanted to regrow your red onion, you'd want to cut that blossom off and set it into a nice little shallow dish, just like that. Okay. And that is going to regrow your onion for you. Okay, look at all of our little veggies that we've got started here. So fun. Okay, since we're on the onion topic, let's talk about green onions. Green onions are one of my faves and they are also so easy to start. I mean, most of the time they already come with roots. They are just begging to be repotted, replanted and regrown. So, you know, quit going to the grocery store, buying more, you know, wasting your money. Just have a little vessel. I change the, the water every day, honestly, every day or so with these guys, um, just because I find it gets a little bit murky. That's always a great way to tell if your, if your water needs to be changed, just if it's looking a little bit murky. Um, but that's honestly really all you have to do is you can use the nice big green part for whatever, you know, recipe you're making. And you really only need the bottom um, two to three inches of the green onion to actually grow. I act, I really love the flavor of the white part of the onion. Um, but that being said, this is what you need to have to actually regrow it. And you'll start to basically see whole new green shoots regrowing. So you can maintain it in a hydroponic system like this, which we've already talked about. But what I'll actually do is I'll replant it into um, some soil, which I'll show you how I do that here. So I'm gonna replant this guy into some soil here. This is just regular potting soil. I'm gonna pre-moisten my soil. And why I love doing this is because, like I said, it's going to be a lot more nutritious and you're going to have plump, fresh, amazing tasting green onions available to you at all times. So it's great. It's honestly, it's awesome. It's too, too, too awesome. So I'm gonna let that soil kind of just leach in there a little bit or sorry, that water kind of get into that soil a little bit. But really that's about as easy as it is. You can just cut your green onion just like that. And you can see this guy here, I cut a few days ago and it already has some new growth starting at the top. So I'm gonna stick that guy in there. I'm gonna wait for some new growth to make sure that it's you know doing well. It's a healthy cutting that I've taken. And then I'm just gonna go and stick that right into soil. How awesome. I'm telling you, it is an addiction. It all starts with a green onion. It all starts with one thing that you're like, I'm gonna try and grow that. And then you see how successful you are at growing it and how easy it is to grow. You're like, I'm gonna do this for everything. I'm literally gonna do this for everything. And I encourage you to do so. So check that out. Now you're ready to rock and roll. Now you are ready to rock and roll and grow more and more green onion. It's the best way to do it. You can add fertilizer to your soil. Um, there's lots of, like I said, nutrients in your soil that aren't existing in water. So if you're just sticking to water propagation, try mixing in some soil, all right? So that is green onion. Let's talk about garlic. Garlic's fabulous, garlic's popular. It's one of my uh, favorite aliens to grow. I'm gonna put this guy off to the side here. Now, garlic, there's a few different ways that you can grow it. You can already see this guy has a sprout coming. And I picked this guy specifically 
just to show you that in fact, when your garlic starts to sprout, it changes the flavor of the garlic itself. So you really do want to um, harvest or use your garlic before it starts to sprout like this, okay? Um, now I can actually just go ahead and straight up plant this entire bulb. Those are roots in the bottom there, okay? So I can stick this right into, you know, pot of soil, just like this. I can cover it, water it, and it will grow. It'll grow all new garlic, literally, easy as that. Another thing that you can do, if you don't have a whole garlic head, maybe you've got just a couple, is you wanna remove the skin. Again, get a shallow dish, just like this. These guys already have roots starting and you can also see grow tips, grow points at the very top. Can you guys see that? Yep. Yeah. And that's going to grow into a nice fresh garlic stock. So that's another way that you can grow your own garlic and reuse. Maybe you've got just a couple pieces laying around. Maybe you're just looking for something fun Maybe you're just looking to try your green thumb, try your hand at growing something. Garlic, easy, easy, easy. You can also do the um, moist paper towel where you can put like, just like we did with the, with the, um, the ginger. <laughs> There's birds going crazy in my backyard apparently. I don't know if anybody is following my bird like craze that's happening in my backyard, but there's some crazy bird action <laughs> happening back there and I don't know what I just witnessed. Maybe a murder. I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, back to our garlic. Garlic is great. You can totally grow it easily, um, especially if you've only if this is all you've got is a couple little cloves. Just kind of stick it like that. You don't want to cover the whole thing in water, just the base, and it will reroot and start to grow. And you can plant it up in some soil, just like we did with the green onion, and that is easy breezy. Okay, how about carrots? How many people here think that you can completely regrow a whole new carrot from just cutting off the end of this carrot here? A couple people. This is kind of a misconception is that um, people believe that they can regrow a carrot from a whole carrot. Look at the size of this carrot, by the way. Oh my God, it looks amazing. Um, in fact, you cannot. What you can do, however, is you can cut off the tip of your carrot, okay? Get another shallow dish, stick that in there. And what you'll actually start to see is green vegetation growing out the top. And those are called carrot greens. That's all that's going to grow from our carrot, all right, are those carrot greens. Now, carrot greens are incredibly nutritious and delicious, believe it or not. So if you're wanting to um, maybe find new things that you can put into your stews, into your soups, into um, your ch chilies, um, maybe you're a smoothie person and you really are trying to pack your smoothies full of more greenery, um, carrot greens are incredibly nutritious. And this is a very easy way to grow carrot greens is by taking the, the tops of your carrots, sticking them in water and watching them grow. So that is how you would regrow your carrots just like that, okay? Fun way to do it. Lastly, I'm going to talk about lettuce or any collard greens. And um, I've got just this nice, beautiful head of lettuce here. And I'm growing so much lettuce right now in my garden, it's out of control. Um, but I went ahead and I picked up a nice fresh head of lettuce so I could show you guys how to do it from grocery store bought lettuce. And what you're gonna do, pick up your lettuce. I have so, so much, like I said, growing outside, but it's all, you know, in my garden, it's actually been potted up and, and rooted. So I'm not going to unroot it to bring it in here. Um, but you absolutely can do that is what I'll do. I have a whole blow. I have a full blown salad going on here at this point is when you pick up a nice fresh head of lettuce like this, and it can be romaine, it can be iceberg lettuce, it can be this like fancy green lettuce. I don't know what this lettuce is called, curly lettuce. This is my favorite. Um, but what you wanna do is cut about two to three inches from the base, similar to what we did with the celery. And from there, you'll take that end of your lettuce. Um, I'm just gonna show you guys like this. And you can either stick it into a vase or a vessel like this. Probably needs just a little bit more water. 
and it will keep your lettuce fresh. Now I found that the last time I did this, the bottom layers of my lettuce were getting really like mushy and yellow and that's okay. You can just peel those layers off. But it's a great way to keep your lettuce fresh. Okay, this is actually just in general, a great way to keep your lettuce fresh. If you have enough space in your in your uh, fridge, you can do it just like this, but you can cut your lettuce. Like I said, use all of this if you're ready to. And um, that base will continue to regrow and regrow just like your celery, okay? Another really, really easy vegetable to regrow. Um, and you can, lettuce actually does grow really well in a simple hydroponic system, so just water. Um, but I started a few different lettuces myself and they're all outside growing in my garden. And when I, some people make the uh, mistake when they go out to harvest their lettuces, they just cut a few, um, a few leaves off when in fact, you need to cut the whole lettuce head. And again, leaving a few inches at the base so that it can regrow. But similar to basil, and we can talk about basil, but you wanna cut the whole head off, not just a few pieces. And that's going to encourage and stimulate new growth. So if you've got lettuce at home and you're not sure how to actually harvest it, is you wanna cut the whole head off. This is a lot of lettuce. So I'm going to just leave it until I'm ready to harvest it because I got a whole lot of lettuce going on right now and I don't want to waste any. So I'm going to leave it just like this for now. Basil is a question that I get all the time. And um, another mistake that people make when harvesting basil is they'll just cut a couple leaves off of their basil plant. When in fact, you want to cut um, the head of your basil off because that's going to actually promote and stimulate more growth and, and new growth. So if you have basil at home and you're not sure about how to actually um, harvest it, you know, you're cutting a couple leaves off here and there, try cutting a whole head off and see what happens. You will have a nice big full basil, I can assure you. Um, okay, I'm sure there's a lot of questions and I like to reserve the last you know, 15 minutes or so to questions. So if you have them, Feel free to type them in the chat. Olivia is going to read them out to me, um, yes. or you're welcome to, I believe, raise your hand, unmute yourself and ask yourself. Absolutely. So Emma, I do have um, a list of questions that have kind of been populating in the chat throughout this session, which is great. And I do have two virtual hands are up and it's always fun to start with the virtual hands. Um, so Steven, you're first on my list and then we'll go to Sarah. So Steven, go ahead. I'm gonna click ask to unmute and ask your question. Awesome. Thanks, Olivia. Hi, Emma. I have a kind of a weird question. I, I regrew some mint about a year and a half ago from a cutting I got from a grocery store, but the leaves are tiny. They're about a quarter of the size they were on the original. What can I do to get them to be big again? That is a good question. I think Emma just froze, so we'll give it just a second. Hang on. <laughs> I also have a mint plant in my back. Sorry, can you guys still hear me? Yeah, sorry, you just froze for a second. So if you want to start over, that'd be great. Perfect. I think you are back. Are we back? Yep, should be good. Okay, I'm just going to change my internet real quickly here. No I think it's a little Well, Emma switches her internet. Yeah, I was saying I have a I believe mint your question. Well. Oh, there we go. We're good. We're back. Yep, we're good. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so your small leaves on your mint. Um, what I have found with my personal experience uh, with mint, and it's actually happening to my mint right now, is kind of the same thing. Smaller leaves are starting to 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 grow, and I believe it's because I've stunted the growth of my mint. Um, so I actually just recently repotted it into a larger pot. Mint grows like crazy. It's almost a weed. That's like how crazy it grows. So it needs a lot of space. Um, you might want to consider giving it a bigger space to grow in. And um, that would likely encourage larger leaves. So um, if you've ever heard of bonsai trees and essentially bonsai is, is the act of, of stunting a, a young plant's growth and continuing to stunt that growth um, so that it's only getting small leaves. It's only getting small branches. And um, it seems to me that potentially that might be what, what is happening with your mint is, um, is you're kind of stunting its growth. Try giving it some bigger space to grow in and see if that has an effect on, on the leaves size. Yeah, let me know how that works for you. Great. Thanks. 
All right, so let's move on to Sarah. I see you have your virtual hand raised, so I've requested to unmute you and go ahead. Hello. Um, I have a number of things growing in my outdoor garden. So I wanted to circle back to that banana water uh, conversation and what vegetables would be best for uh, like potassium rich water, for example. Literally anything, anything and everything. Um, I love using it in all of my crucifix, cruciferous um, vegetables. I'm growing Brussels sprouts and um, kale right now, but I literally use it on everything. I use it on my ornamental garden as well. So all of my flowers, like everything in my outdoor garden gets my banana water. Um, all right. There's nothing bad that you can use it on. Um, you truly can use it on everything. It's one of those fabulous DIY fertilizers that you can make that has no wrong uh, place that you can put it, except for indoor plants because fruit. Yeah, fair. Fair. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I hope that, I hope that answers your question. Great, and we have another um, hand up, which is awesome. I'm loving this. So Karen, I'm gonna request to unmute you and then you are good to ask your question. Um, so the banana uh, water, um, I'm putting coffee, um, grounds and eggshells on my veggies and a couple of the hydrangeas and rhododendrons and whatnot. Would that do anything with the banana water? Like, um, there's like have a negative effect by mixing. Yeah. yeah. No. So you can absolutely use that all together. I've done the okay. same thing. I'm using eggshells and coffee grinds, um, okay. as well in my gardens. I'm using like a whole bunch of everything. Cause why not? <laughs> Um, but no, that you won't have a negative effect if you're using the three of them together. But that's a really great question, Karen. Yeah. Okay. And while I'm unmuted then, I had a question, so you can ignore my question later. But <laughs> it's the same way is when I'm um, harvesting it, I've been harvesting just my leaves, not taking the whole head. So I should be taking the whole head. To yes. A spinach the same as a lettuce. Yes, you should be taking the whole head. Um, and that's actually going to give you more yield is if you, if you're taking one leaf off at a time, lettuce doesn't really regenerate that way that grows from the inside out. So if you're taking the whole head, it's going to regenerate a lot more yield for you. Um, so yeah, I think a, I, I even was making that mistake years ago when I first started growing lettuce was whenever I wanted a bowl of salad, I just went out and snipped a couple leaves, but you're in fact, you're supposed to take the whole head. Um, so try that. Make sure you're always leaving a good three to four inches of the base so that it can regrow. So my spinach is only like probably six or seven inches tall right now. So, and it's not a head. It, it does have like, it's just coming out. So, yeah. so I would not be capturing all my leaves if I left that much. So for spinach, it's a little bit different. That's okay. Um, yeah, for spinach, it is, at least from my experience, I, I have been able to cut a few here and there. And it's been, it's, it's a, it's a different way that it grows than a head of lettuce. Anything that's growing in sort of a head, similar to yeah. celery, uh, you want to cut it all at the same time, but spinach, you can get away uh, with just cutting a bit here and there, but you do want to leave a little bit of a base there so that it can regrow and regenerate. Okay. Awesome. Great. So I'll move on to some of the questions that were submitted into the chat. Um, so I'll just start going through them in the order that they were submitted. Um, but does celery need sun or shade? Celery needs sun. Okay. So, and that's when, even when you're um, propagating it from when it's just kind of the base, oh, yes. sun, uh, more sun celery, is better. Really the only plant, the only options that need shade or a darker space are going to be your roots. So your, your root vegetables like potatoes and ginger, turmeric, um, onions, um, okay. anything that is green needs mm -hmm. sun. So that's kind of a good point is if it's so green, it needs, it needs sunlight. Oh, that's, that's a great point of reference, especially for beginners like me. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. It's, it's easy. It's like green. Okay. It needs sun. Sun. Perfect. Awesome. And then I have another question here, um, and I think this would apply to maybe some herbs and stuff too, but what happens when celery flowers? Does it die and should we be pruning those flowers off? So when celery, similar to cilantro flowers, that's called bolting, when it starts to really bolt and shoot out flowers, it can have a very 
um, a very obvious change in flavor for your herbs and for your celery, it can change the flavor. Um, you can leave that. Um, what I, I love with my celery flowers because it will, um, it will release seeds and those flower, those seeds will then reseed themselves and I'll grow more celery next year. Um, but basically once the flower has bloomed and the sort of the, the color has faded and the flower has faded, you can absolutely go ahead and, and prune that away. Um, but really, uh, I try to avoid things like my cilantro from flowering and my basil from flowering because especially with cilantro is once it, once it bolts or once it flowers is it's essentially no longer edible. It's mm -hmm. edible, but the flavor that you want from cilantro isn't there anymore. And same with basil, the, fl the flavor completely changes. So I try to uh, really prune my herbs so that I'm okay. not, um, I'm not getting them to flower. Um, that's, okay. that's a, a really great question. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks that that was Stephen that asked that. So thank you. And then we've got Karen. I'm going to ask to unmute you again and, and let it, let it go with your question. Um, so harvesting cilantro, this is my first year that I've actually, it's not bolted and gone to seed really quickly and it's now prolific. So how am I actually keeping it in check so that it doesn't bolt? Like Regular pruning. Regular pruning. Mine is in the same scenario, Karen. This is my first year actually growing healthy, full cilantro. Normally every year, I don't know why, my cilantro has just been like my worst performing herb. Um, but my cilantro is doing really well. I prune it almost every day. Any of the bottom leaves or new growth, I'm pruning. I'm, I'm topping, basically, if you know what topping is, where I'm topping the very um, apex, apical growth, the very top growth, I'm pruning okay. that. And okay. that's sort of sending a message to um, the, the plant that uh, to, to not release those hormones, just to, to, to kick it off into a uh, bolting drive. So I just, um, I try okay. to just continuously prune. Okay. I'll do great. That. I hope that Thanks. helps. That's great. And that's good for me as well. So thank you for asking that question. Um, okay. So I have one going back to propagating the potato. Um, does the root part, I'm assuming that means like the eye part we talked about, um, does that go into the water or is that out of the water? The, so the eye is actually not the root. The okay. eye is going to be the vegetative growth and that you want out of the water. Okay. okay. Um, okay. that part you always want to have sticking up because that's basically what's going to shoot through the soil and then capture mm -hmm. all of that sunlight and photosynthesize. The right. root is basically going to be the potato itself. Oh, okay. Yes. Awesome. Very cool. All right. And then my next question, um, for onion, uh, sorry for ginger. If we were to grow ginger outside, when should we plant it? How, when do we know when it's ready to plant? Um, so I basically, whenever I'm seeing like three to four leaves, um, and follow along, like I said, I'll, I'll post some pictures of what this looks like in, in a couple days, in a couple weeks. But when I really have, you know, a healthy stock, um, some sturdy leaves and, and root system started, that's when I'll plant it outside. Um, so really you only want to plant it, um, into soil and outside when you're seeing some healthy root growth and when you're seeing, um, you know, some, some leaves, which are going to be responsible for, for capturing that sunlight and, and photosynthesizing for the plant. So um, I hope that that helps answer your question. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. And then this one was on my mind as well. So I'm really glad that someone asked it. Um, I apologize. I can't remember whose question this is, but it's a great one. How many times can you regrow the same celery, green onion, lettuce, kind of the things that we spoke about today? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I personally have regrown like four to five times. Um, and sometimes why it doesn't regrow that sixth time or that seventh time is because maybe I didn't change the water. Maybe it's because I neglected it. Um, okay. To be honest, I don't know the answer to that question. If there's a limit and it's probably based on the plant itself. Right. Um, I don't know what that, that cap is on the yield. Um, but you know, multiple times for sure, for sure. Right. I think the best way is to really plant it in soil and have it continuously regrowing and, you know, harvesting that celery and then, 
and then taking that scrap and then reproducing again with that scrap. And truly you can take one, one vegetable and reuse it multiple, multiple, multiple times. So yeah, awesome. that, it's cool stuff. That's great. And that kind of leads into the next question to take care of that plant. Um, can you recommend any organic fertilizer that would kind of be easily accessible at, at your regular home and garden center? Yeah, absolutely. So apart from making your own banana um, fertilizer, there's, um, there's, there's so many. Re truly, if you go into Canadian Tire, Home Depot, um, your local nursery, and just ask for organic fertilizer, there's a multitude of brands. Um, the one that I currently use is called Gaia Organics, G-A-I-A -A Organics. It's a Canadian company. It's all organic. Their stuff is amazing. I've never seen such full and unbelievable growth this early in the season from my from my my greens from my garden it's my first year using it um so i really can see a difference if you can find gaia green organics um try that one uh, another thing that i like to use for any of my edible um greens that i'm growing is called rock phosphate um, it's sort of like a granular pebble and I'll put that at the bait. I'll, I'll dig my hole. I'll sprinkle mm. a little bit of rock phosphate and then I'll put my tomato plant or my Brussels sprouts or my lettuce right on top and then I'll plant it. And uh, rock phosphate is something that's like not naturally occurring in our soils, but our plants really need it. And it's a fabulous thing that you can add to your planting regime if you want to have tastier and fuller vegetables. So you can give that a try. Gaia Green Organics as well sells that. Awesome. Fantastic. And I think we have time for one last question. Stephen, I see your hands up, so I'll, I'll let you go right ahead. Yeah, thanks, Olivia. Uh, so the, the question on the, the ginger and, and garlic as well, uh, when, I, when I asked when, I think what I meant more was what time of year rather than uh, how okay. far along in development. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's great. You know, the springtime is always a great time to plant anything and everything. Um, garlic has a very low uh, temper, temperature tolerance. So you can have it growing well into the fall and ginger does as well. Actually, ginger has quite a low temperature uh, tolerance as well. So, I mean, the best time to plant anything is as early as possible, at least in our grow zone, because we have such a short growing season and the longer you can have it outside growing with our full sun, the better. Um, so truly, as soon as you have that green vegetation starting, get it out into your garden and, and start growing it. Yeah. Great question. Amazing. All right. Well, thank you, Emma, so much for sharing your insights um, with the college community today. Um, thank you, everyone, for your questions. They were so wonderful. I'm, I'm so glad you all got something from this session and had such great engagement. So thank you all for that. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. But I want to extend a big thank you and a virtual round of applause to Emma. There we go. My virtual clapping hands. <laughs> I appreciated this so much. It was such a wonderful session. Um, it was a pleasure to learn from you today. So uh, if you'd like to check out Emma's website or her social media pages, they were mentioned a few times and they'd be a really wonderful resource um, for all of you who are interested in this. Um, so we'll place those links in the chat now and they've been placed a few times as well. As I mentioned, the event will be recorded and available in the coming days on the AC On Demand website. And the link, um, my colleague Samantha has posted that in the chat, which is fantastic. And of course, we host a variety of events every month. So for more information, please visit the Algonquin College Student Support Services event calendar. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, um, and Facebook. And thank you again, Emma, and thanks everyone. It was such a wonderful event. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for having me. If I didn't get a chance to get to your question, feel free to send me a note over Instagram. And as I said, this is my way of growing things. <laughs> Maybe you at home have your own method and there's no wrong way. Truly, we're all our own urban botanists. We're all our own gardeners. So I'd love to hear how everyone else is growing. They're harvesting their vegetables um, and roots this year. So um, feel free to follow me there. And uh, thank you so much again for having me. I hope you all have a fabulous rest of your day and rest of your week. Thanks everyone. Bye now.